we have Dr. Lori Nepper and Dr. Claire Yanta, um, who are going to be presenting about headache as a subspecialty of neurology. Dr. Nepper is um, at the University of Pittsburgh, and she's the neurology clerkship director there, currently chair of the fourth year elective subcommittee. Dr. Nepper has mentored numerous neurology residents and medical students and has been teaching competency-based medical education for the past five years with presentations at the AAMC, ICBME meetings, and she's a core member of the Women in Neurology group, which has a really active Twitter if you're interested. They have great content. Dr. Yanta is a mid-career headache neurologist who is among, um, who is serving with the University of Pittsburgh Headache Division and also serves as the resident clinic preceptor. Um, she's active in medical education at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. So we have some really awesome faculty with us today. We're so excited to learn about them and the subspecialty um, headache within neurology. Please watch the chat towards the end of the session. We have like a two or three brief eval just to get a sense of what went well. Um, any questions you have throughout the session, please feel free to put them into the chat so that we can answer in live time or perhaps get to it at the end. Um, so feel free to ask questions along the way. It's really great to see the engagement and to make sure people are understanding everything. And so with that, we are going to turn it over to our wonderful pre presenters today. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, thank you so much for having both of us. Yeah, thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen now. So we're gonna start by telling you why we went into neurology separately um, and then how um, we kind of ended up in headache and then um, Claire put together a little presentation about what's it like to be a headache neurologist. Um, so can everybody see the screen? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, so Claire's going to advance the slide. Um, so I'm a Pittsburgh native. Um, my brother's running our fifth generation printing business. Nobody in my family was in medicine. Um, and I went to a small school in in um, Pennsylvania called Franklin and Marshall, um, mainly because my swimming coach knew the coach there, um, but I also majored in chemistry. Um, so I was either in the chemistry lab or in the swimming pool and found that I, I had kind of known going into medical school that I was really interested in medicine um, and then decided that definitely I wanted to apply. Um, then I was fortunate enough to get into the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine where I went to medical school. I started getting interested in neurology in my neuroscience um, course. Uh, I found that what I liked about it was it was kind of like chemistry and math. It was a lot of problem solving, listening to the patient and kind of figuring out and then localizing the lesion and then coming up with a differential diagnosis. So um, that's why I went into neurology. Um, I did, uh, then I, after I went, was at Pitt, I went to the University of Iowa for my neurology residency, wanted to try out a different location. Um, and I became really interested. They had a huge stroke service there. And to me, that was really fun because, you know, you could suddenly see the emergency patient and immediately look at them and know where the lesion was and not only where the lesion was, but what the vessel was involved. And then based on what part of the vessel was involved that you, what you thought um, you know, what was the cause of the stroke? So you could kind of, it was all a correlation between basic neuroscience and um, applied neurology. So then I went to, um, back to Pittsburgh, um, where my family was. Um, and uh, I was married at that point. We both had, um, I had, I did a stroke fellowship there um, for a year. And then I became stroke faculty. Next slide, Claire, please. So then I had this kind of weird, course. So, so I'm the example of how you can go, do a lot of different things in neurology um, and still end up back in the same place. So I helped um, Dr. Wexter start the Stroke Institute. Um, after I did my fellowship, he was coming back to the university and um, the stroke services were very small, but we were doing a lot of the acute stroke trials and arterial thrombolysis. And, um, and then um, my husband worked at one of the other hospitals in the city and when they went bankrupt um, after about 10 years of me being kind of having an interest in stroke, um, but still keeping an interest in general neurology while I was a stroke neurologist, um, we moved to a small town in um, the western part of Massachusetts in this beautiful area called the Berkshires. So if any of you ever become neurologists or headache neurologists, they're always looking for neurologists. It's just a gorgeous place. And I raised my girls there. And 
when I went there, I joined a, a group of neurologists and neurosurgeons, and then everybody left the county. And there, so I never thought I would be able to run a business, but I opened my own little practice and did primary um, neurology. While I was doing primary neurology, I found that um, there was a really interesting breadth of um, neurology, but I really liked the fact that um, headaches were very treatable and that I had seen patients that had never had a trip tan and had been struggling and losing all these vacations and days off of work because they had never had a trip tan. Um, so then I decided, well, maybe I want to do headache neurology. Um, so after my kids got in college and my parents got sick, I decided I was going to come back to Pittsburgh. So fortunately, I was able to come back to, again, the University of Pittsburgh um, Medical Center um, and join the headache neurology group. Um, which has really grown. We now have five, five headache neurologists and two physician's assistants, and we're very, very busy. And now we even have, um, we've had several, we started a fellowship and we've had several of our residents go through fellowship and stay. And we have a pediatric and adult neurology resident currently that's doing a fellowship with us. Um, as part of coming back to Pitt, I started getting more involved in curriculum development. So I do a lot of, um, the elective, I run the electives in the fourth year and I run the neurology clerkship um, and do teaching at every kind of different level. Um, so that's how I ended up in headache neurology. Now, what kind of things do I like? Next slide. Outside of neurology, you're still able to have a life, which is what I also liked about because I really like I really liked surgery and neurosurgery as well. I, I love the personality of surgeons. I love the neurosurgeons, but I wasn't sure that I would be able to balance that and I knew that I wanted to have a family. Um, so I do have a family. These are my girls here. Um, I have two daughters that are grown now in their late twenties. One of them is now married. Um, and I was able to not miss anything. Um, even well, they did say that when I was a stroke attending that they spent a lot of time in the, the radiology suite while I was doing the exams on the patients that were getting intraarterial thrombolysis. So they did spend a lot of time seeing x-rays and meeting the helicopter, but, but they uh, felt that was really interesting. Um, so, and now uh, I'm part of a rowing team. We row on the rivers around Pittsburgh. It's a great place to row. We also race all over the place. And I'm also in a running group. My, I run with, this is a family picture. We were at a turkey trot. Um, and my running group also does line dancing. So um, you have lots of time to do other things as a headache neurologist. I also read like a fiend. Um, I wish I could say it was always my neurology and headache journals, but I also like fiction. That's where I am. Now Claire's gonna tell you. Claire was my, Claire was my resident and then we trained her as a fellow. Um, and we were so lucky that she decided to stay because she's been a remarkable addition to our neurology department, our headache division, and our medical education community. Oh, thank you, Dr. Knepper. Yeah, we, so we've been working together for a long time. Um, so my uh, journey is a little bit different than Dr. Knepper's. Um, so I am a Pittsburgh native as well, but I did not stay for my undergraduate medical education uh, or undergraduate med medical education. I went to undergrad at Duke. Uh, so there's the Duke Chapel there on the left for those of you that aren't familiar. Uh, and then uh, my father is an internist, actually. He's a physician as well. And he told me to go into business. So I applied to medical school. And so I went to the University of Chicago for medical school. And so that's a picture of me on the left at the AAN meeting uh, in 2014, uh, trying on the Cephaly device, which actually is a, a neuromodulatory device for migraine management. Uh, that handsome gentleman on my uh, on the right of the screen is my husband, who is an emergency physician. And so I think this and this is a picture of him in the uh, the Stat Medivac helicopter um, as one of his required uh, helicopter shifts as a resident, which I think kind of throws into sharp relief sort of the differences between his chosen specialty and mine. I love it. Uh, yeah, we met in medical school, um, and uh, even though we had identical you know medical school um, experiences, uh, our our professional careers have taken pretty different turns as far as sort of the, the level of adrenaline and kind of what we see. So I um, had my babies during uh, residency, uh, my, my first baby during residency, my second baby during fellowship. So um, for those of you that kind of wonder when is a good time, I think the answer is that there's really never a good time. So if it's important to you, you just make it happen. Um, so, uh, and now, you know, fast forward eight years later, here they are. 
Um, so there's my, my son, Sam, my daughter, Maddie, this is their first day of school this year. My son's in second grade, my daughter's in kindergarten. And uh, they have a longstanding Halloween tradition of my daughter dressing up as something adorable and my son dressing up as something super scary and then taking a picture together. So um, as far as kind of my decision for, well, I guess kind of to backtrack into my decision to, uh, to go into neurology, I mean, I initially went into medical school with the, with the idea of a doctor being my dad who is a primary care doctor. And so I initially thought that I was gonna be an internist or do some kind of internal medicine. Uh, I went through the first year curriculum and you know, we had my, I had my neuroanatomy course in the first year and I thought, absolutely not. This makes no sense to me. This way, I had a lot of neurophobia in my first year. I then went through my, my clinical rotations and I discovered in medicine that I actually really don't like anything below the diaphragm, which ruled out a lot of internal medicine for me. Um, and then I got to my, my headache, or excuse me, my neurology rotation, and it finally, the, the, the clinical side of neurology is really what hooked me. And the, the marriage between the, the localization exercise uh, and, the, and the logic of the neuro neurologic examination and how you can, how that really informs how you approach every patient. And I still, I really like how neurology, I think more than any other specialty, the, the physical exam is really the crux of your evaluation and all your diagnostics that you have uh, just kind of help to shore up the, the suspicion that you already have based on a good history and exam. So that's why I chose neurology. And then, so I initially um, went into my residency really thinking strongly about a different specialty, a subspecialty of neurology. And it kind of became apparent to me as I saw more neurologic patients that I actually was looking for a little bit something different. Uh, and that, that particular lifestyle that I was thinking about wasn't really for me. And so I was thinking, you know, what kind of patients do I get the most satisfaction seeing as a neurologist? And it really came, became apparent to me that it was the headache patients. And, you know, being in, I'm, so I'm an immediate gratification person. What I really like about headache medicine is that people get better and they get better fast. So you, you can have somebody with 30 headache days a month and they come in to see you, you put them on a good treatment plan and they come back three months later and their headaches are down to three or four days a month. And I've had more than one patient literally tell me, you've given me my life back, which I think is why all of us go to medical school. It's of course not as sort of hyper acute as far as the, the, the degree to which they get better is things like stroke. Um, but I also like to sleep, uh, eat and sit down too much to do stroke medicine or stroke neurology. So this was a nice kind of marriage where it's, you can see the, the, the benefits really quickly, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, but I also, you know, like I said, I had my, my first baby in residency and my husband by nature of his profession is always working nights, weekends, and holidays. And so I knew one of us had to have a more nine to five, eight to five kind of schedule to be able to take care of kids too. So I really like the lifestyle of headache medicine as well. But uh, that's, of course, the added benefit. But ultimately, why I chose it was really because I get a lot of satisfaction seeing headache patients. I also really like um, seeing the population that headache most clusters in, which tends to be younger people, tends to be people in their peak productive years of life, tends to skew a lot towards women as well. So I see people that look a lot like me, um, women in, of childbearing age. And I like talking about neurologic issues during pregnancy, uh, around pregnancy, reproduction, contraception. Um, and so I, I've been able to reach that specific population that I think is often kind of underrepresented in clinical trials. And certainly when you're talking about pregnancy, uh, there are no, pregnant women aren't really in any clinical trial. And so people are therefore really scared to touch them. Uh, and so I, I felt like this is a, a unique way to be able to reach out to that specific population uh, within neurology. And then irony of ironies. So I have been a migraine sufferer myself since I was a teenager. And so, and I do share this with my patients and every, they always uniformly ask, oh, is that why you went into headache? And the answer is no. As I explained before, really it, my own headaches had nothing to do with my mental calculus deciding to go into neurology initially. It actually wasn't until I was in my fellowship where they got severe enough that I actually required treatment. Uh, so I think now's a good time to point out that Dr. Nepper not only is my, um, my mentor and my colleague, she's also my headache doctor. Um, so I, I had had, like I said, intermittent migraines for a long time, but they weren't really that bad or that frequent until I started my fellowship. And I initially attributed it to 
a different, it was actually like July of my fellowship was when they started to get really bad. So the very first month of my fellowship, I started noticing my own headaches getting more significant. And then I found out I was pregnant a month later. And so that seemed to be what kind of kicked them off initially. Uh, but then since then, I've developed chronic migraine. And I'm glad to say they're under good control right now, uh, but it's still very much a part of my life. And I've gone through a lot of preventative and abortive medications to reach this level of adequate control. And, you know, I still have uh, days where, you know, I'm listening to my, my own patients talk about their headaches and, my, and I have a screaming headache myself. So I wish I could say that I you know, started to pyramid and lived happily ever after. But I, on the other hand, I, I really actually value having that personal experience because it allows me to connect to my patients on a very real level where I can say, I absolutely understand everything that you're feeling because I felt it myself. Wait, can I just jump in for a second, Claire? Sure. So I didn't think I ever had migraines. I'd have an occasional like bad headache back here. And um, my kids, one of my daughters had migraine with aura and I thought that doesn't come anywhere. And then I was in clinic one day, you know, cause you listen to your patients talk about the aura and I was looking at a patient and all of a sudden I saw this little flickering light on the left. And, and this was like, I'm much older than Claire. And I saw this little flickering light. And then all of a sudden the patient's face started getting blurry and I'm just talking to them because I'm thinking I can't let the patient know I'm having a stroke so I'm looking at them and it got bigger and bigger and then all of a sudden there was this big C exactly like you read about and my patients tell me about but I always talk and it really looked like that and there was a perfect zigzag line all along the outside edge of it that was flashing like a camera so I looked at them and then I looked at my watch and I timed it and I didn't have a headache and then I got the patient out walked them out um, and it was starting to get better after about 30 minutes. And then I went out and said to the five headache doctors, what do you think? And they're all like, this is probably an aura. Now, one of our a little bit more worrisome um, colleagues was like, you're having a retinal event, call my ear. And so I eventually went to the, I, I had a few more and I was on call and I'd been up at night. And I think that's why, because we get called all night and then work the next day. And I've only had a handful of them, but now I understand what my patients are saying. You can't drive when you're having an aura. So, and then once you start, like in your neurology, you find out a lot of like our residents are realizing they have migraines because they're in clinic and hearing about it. So I think a lot of people have probably headaches they thought weren't migraines all those years. And then suddenly now like that they learn more about it. It's underdiagnosed for sure. And Dr. Elon just gonna talk about that. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I, I, I read something a couple of years ago that actually was published in the journal Neurology about headache uh, in, in neurology. And so the, the, the prevalence of migraine in the general population is 12%. In neurologists, it's 50%. And in headaches, it's 80%. I didn't know that. So, that was yeah. That's so funny. We can identify it. Yes, absolutely. So, but just to kind of throw this into, into a little bit more sharp relief, whenever I give talks about headache, I usually start by polling my students and asking them how many people have ever had a headache in their life. And pretty much everybody raises their hand. The lifetime prevalence of migraine is, is 66%. And about 45% uh, of the adult population, 46%, has an active headache disorder at any given time. So this is an extremely common group of conditions. It's the most common reason for outpatient neurologic consultation. It's also extremely expensive, uh, somewhere in the order of $13 billion per year when you're thinking about uh, productivity and opportunity cost. Migraine is the number one neurological issue leading to years lived with disability worldwide and number six overall. It's also extremely common to see in the emergency department too. It's about fourth or fifth as far as most common chief complaints in the emergency department. And about 90% of those are for primary headache disorders. So things that we treat in the headache clinic. So specifically what we treat in the headache clinic are migraine. Migraine is, is definitely number one as far as the most common headache condition or group of headache conditions that we see. Of course, the most common headache disorder in the general population is tension type headache, but by definition, it's mild in severity. So unless they're very frequent, they don't really come to see us very often in the headache center. So migraine is definitely what we see most commonly. We do see a lot of other headache conditions too, including cluster headache and other trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias or TACs. We do see tension type headache here and there, usually when they're more on the chronic, at least, at least for me, Dr. Nepper, I don't know about you, but mine typically, if they come to see me, it's because they're, they're you daily. Migraine. Migraine. You hear the same story over and over. Yeah. We do see painful cranial neuralgias as well, trigeminal neuralgia, occipital neuralgia. Post-traumatic headache is a common uh, headache uh, gr uh, group that we see in the headache center as well. 
idiopathic intracranial hypertension, and a variety of other secondary headaches too. So post-stroke headache, post-intracranial hemorrhage, cervical artery dissection headaches, intracranial hypotension headaches, RCVS headaches, we see very commonly. And then there are those other rarer primary headache disorders that you maybe see once in a lifetime uh, that we do see kind of ro rolling through the headache center as well. We also do procedures in headache medicine. So Botox injections uh, and uh, pericranial nerve blocks are probably what we do most commonly. Uh, on a botulinum or Botox is FDA approved in the treatment of chronic migraine. Pericranial nerve blocks, so occipital nerve blocks and trigeminal distribution blocks we use for a variety of headache disorders, including migraine, but also cluster headache, post-traumatic headache, other painful cranial neuralgias as well. And then trigger point injections are also part of what we, part of our armamentarium to treat headache patients. I'm going to jump in for a second too. If you're yep. in primary neurology too, um, and you have somebody that might have swollen discs, you've done the MRI, you know, everything looks okay on the MRI, except there's an empty cella and there are signs of intracranial pressures. A lot of times in solo, you know, when you're out in private practice and sometimes in academic, you'll do a lumbar puncture too. Yes. Okay. There you go. This is also a really exciting time to be a headache specialist because there's been a significant uh, increase in the number of and type of medications that we have available, including the first migraine preventative designed for migraine headache, which are the anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies. And so there are four of them in the, uh, on the market right now. Three of them are sub-Q and one of them is IV. Uh, or that's arenumab, galconezumab, fremenezumab, and eptinizumab. So those are, like I said, the very first migraine preventative medications that are migraine specific, as opposed to other medications like topiramate or propranolol, which were initially designed for different indications. There are also small molecule CGRP receptor uh, antagonists for acute abortive treatment of migraine. And there's some research looking into using those kind of medications for migraine prophylaxis as well. And those are specifically rimetropant or Nurtec and Ubrogepant or Ubrelvi. There's right now one DITAN, which is a 5-HT1F agonist for acute abortive treatment of migraine, and that's lazimididan. And then there are a variety of multiple of uh, neuromodulation devices, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulator, trigeminal nerve stimulator, um, uh, external vagal nerve stimulator, RNS devices. So a variety of devices, both for acute treatment and prevention of migraine headache as well. And I have to say these medications, at least the, so the, the monoclonal antibodies have been absolute game changers in, in headache medicine. So we, that's kind of our background, um, you know, and, and like Dr. Nepper alluded to earlier, you know, she and I, other than being clinical headache doctors, we also are very heavily involved in medical education as well. Um, so Dr. Nepper kind of gave you some of her um, experiences. I'm also the director of the MS1 neuroscience course at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Uh, we're both heavily involved in um, medical student advising and on the curriculum committee at the University of Pittsburgh. So we've been able to uh, develop really robust careers as clinician educators while still maintaining a busy uh, clinical headache medicine practice. So the question is, do you have any questions? The only other thing I want to add to Dr. Yanta's um, amazing, wonderful discussion is, it's always surprising to me, and it comes up at the American Headache Society meetings too, that, um, and when I'm gonna answer that question in a minute, um, that um, so many patients have come to me with migraines and they've never tried a triptan. And the triptans have been around for so long and they're such game changers that um, sometimes I guess, you know, when they go to primary care, they think, or they go to ENT because they think it's sinus, but the triptans are just the simple, easy um, medicine that you have readily available. Um, usually, you know, at least three of them are insurance approved by our insurances. So you can really change somebody's life by giving them a triptan to take away this pain where they've been trying to treat it with the kitchen sink, basically. Um, we have some questions in the chat. Um, Let's see. So, the, so the first is, given the significant cost of the CGRP antagonists and the substantial morbidity and impact of quality of life and primary headache, how do we address healthcare disparities and access to these best treatments for primary headache? 
So, I mean, I think it's an excellent question. Yeah. I think the, the answer ultimately comes down to, I would say, advocacy, um, both at a an organizational, but also at an individual level uh, between uh, an office and your patients as well. As far as insurance companies go, they do have their restrictions on how, and every insurance company is a little bit different, but generally speaking, um, in order to get insurance companies to cover the CGRP monoclonal antibodies, most patients have to have tried and failed or have contraindications to one of the three main classes of migraine preventatives. So that'll be tricyclic antidepressants, beta blockers, and anticonvulsants, so to pyramate or divoprox. And that's so, the American Headache Society guidelines as well. Right. And, and to be honest, you know, I, like, I, like I said, I think these CGRP antibodies are, they, they have been absolute game changers, but I don't think they necessarily have to be first line for everybody. There's, uh, and the American Headache Society e echoes that, uh, that belief as well. It's still reasonable to try those first line, less expensive medications as well, because they do have a, a reasonably good safety record and efficacy record as well. I'm kind of thinking more for those patients who have tried or just have contraindications to those medications. Uh, that's been the group that have been most greatly benefited by, by those medications. And certainly we have to work with insurance company structures that we have. Uh, and sometimes it requires being persistent in uh, persistent and meticulous, so meticulous in your documentation, being willing to write authorization letters to for everybody. Company. Right. Yeah. Um, and so we've been able to, for, for many people, many people, we've been able to get these, these medications with, um, I don't know, I don't want to say ease, but we've been able to get them for patients for whom it is indicated. These exception being if they're just not on the patient's insurance plan at all, which is difficult. And I also think like in terms of um, we've done education and um, right when you see patients and you communicate back to the primary care, you're also like communicating like, hey, like you can use a trip down to these patients in the emergency room. Like, hey, we don't, this is what we use for, and our residents too, it's helpful to have our residents there because they rotate through the headache collective. So they know how to manage a migraine patient when it comes to the emergency room. Um, and then the emergency room knows like, hey, you just don't throw the kitchen sink at them. There's a migraine protocol. This is what you consider this, you should send them all out with a trip tan if there's no contraindication. So um, those those are the kind of things. In terms of the specific one about the, um, the stroke risk, the main risk of stroke and migraine um, seems to be the small increase in stroke risk in patients that have migraine with aura. Um, and that, and it's compounded by migraine with aura if they smoke or they have hypertension, other vascular risk factors. Um, it still remains small, but certainly we discussed, you know, this with our patients. Um, the Amer you know, the um, American College of Gynecology and Obstetrics and Gynecology has put a warning that if you have migraine with aura, um, you shouldn't be on combined birth control pills. And I think that looking back, there are a lot of headache neurologists that have looked at this. Um, a lot of the studies were, were um, mostly in, old, in higher dose um, estrogen. And it seems like the risk of stroke is related to higher doses of estrogen. Um, and certainly in the setting of smoking and other risk factors, they should not be on um, combined contraceptive. But now a lot of the birth control combined ones are very low estrogen. Um, and actually sometimes, you know, if it's a menstrually related that you can actually modulate those by using um, low dose estrogen. Um, but we do tell our patients, and if we have somebody who has a lot of migraine with aura, we will suggest they try progestin only, um, you know, either pills or the progestin only IUDs that have. Um, so those are things that we talk about. Um, in terms of hormone replacement for um, transgender, um, and, and we see it in women that are going through in vitro fertilization, or even in our patients that are going, starting to go into menopause, um, anytime you play around with the hormones and you have, if you have migraines and you get on extra estrogen, um, especially if you have aura, there is a chance that it's going to exacerbate the, the um, the migraine or the migraine with aura. So that's something that we can't always anticipate, but it's definitely a concern. Um, and, and that's the situation with that. There is actually a really nice review of the literature on um, oral contraceptives oh. and stroke risk that came out in the journal Headache in, in 2018 uh, that really kind of, it, it highlighted very nicely. And basically there's just not a whole lot of great evidence, especially with these lower, um, lower estrogen-based 
uh, contraceptives because the data that we have is based on older studies with higher doses of estrogen than what's uh, often available in most conventional, conventional combination contraceptives today. So we treat it more as a case by case basis. And so what the way I counsel my patients is I let them know of the risk. So your risk is Overall, is probably pretty low if they're otherwise healthy. And certainly if they smoke, I say you should absolutely avoid estrogen because we know that that significantly increases your risk. But if they're otherwise healthy, non-smoking um, patients without other significant vascular risk factors, I let them know that they do have a probably a mildly, at least a mildly elevated risk of stroke on estrogen-based contraceptives. It's a, it's a risk benefit sort of thing though. If the benefits of the estrogen based birth control or whatever it is outweigh the, feel, they feel like that outweighs the, the likely low risk, then I say go for it because most women really don't like non combination contraceptives uh, for a variety of reasons, including breakthrough bleeding and um, having, at least in case, in the case of the mini pill, having to take it at the same time every day. So unless you're talking about IUDs, um, which some people are also just kind of leery about as well, although they, they work very well, certainly. Um, for those patients that don't wanna do IUDs and uh, really don't like the mini pill, it's, it's hard to tell them you absolutely cannot take a low dose estrogen-based contraceptive. Um, the risk benefit ratio, I agree. When their risk is probably pretty low anyway. The other thing that I want to mention in terms of like my interest in the vascular overlap of like stroke and migraine is that patients with migraine have an increased risk of other vascular complications. So there's this reversible cerebral vasoconstriction that can occur when you're on certain medications or um, in the postpartum period, they're at a higher risk for that. Migraine patients are more likely to have preeclampsia or eclampsia. Um, and even they have a slightly higher risk of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I always say that if my patient calls me and said they've been to the ER with a different type of headache, you really need to listen to your patients. It's the worst headache ever. It's a different type of headache. It was a sudden headache. You really need to think about the fact that there probably is some kind of like genetic endothelial difference in patients with migraines, and they may very well not be their migraine. It may be a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you know, um, diffuse vasoconstriction. So, so that's another interesting thing about migraine. Yeah, I agree. That's, you know, not, uh, not only are you not immune from other headache types by having migraine, you're in fact at an increased risk of having other secondary headaches because, because you have migraine. So it's important to, to keep that in mind. I want to make sure we, we answer the, the second question here in the chat. So what are your thoughts on diet and headache in terms of neuroprotection? Diet and headache. So that is the, that's a really interesting question. And so we, know that there are food triggers and migraine. At, at least we have a wealth of anecdotal evidence and some evidence in the literature to, su to support certain foods being triggered. So alcohol be, uh, being a big one that most people tend to, tend to endorse, caffeine as well. Food triggers and migraine are kind of controversial though, because we, there is a phase of migraine called the prodrome that starts up to days before the headache phase actually kicks in. And that can include things like changes in feeding behaviors, food cravings. So what happens is that the migraine process starts, you get a craving for chocolate or whatever it is, eat the chocolate, get the headache you were gonna get anyway, and then falsely blame the chocolate on it. So counseling patients about food triggers and migraine is a little bit controversial. The ketogenic diet, I, I've, I've come across that as well. I think it's interesting. I think it practically speaking is extremely difficult to do because to put somebody into ketosis, they have to be really good about measuring their macros. And also I think because, I think migraine is just so heterogeneous that there are going to be some people for whom that drastic change in the diet is actually probably gonna make things worse. Wait, I have to jump in and say something about triggers. So um, there have been all these studies coming out of a variety of places showing that people who have migraines just have a hypersensitive brain. So like patients with migraine have, a lot of them have photosensitivity in between their migraine. They don't like flickering black and white patterns, the light, the lights coming towards you at on dark night and those kind of things. So the, the, the bottom line is that um, patients with migraines, if you take too much caffeine, so we see this from Excedrin migraine, if they take caffeine, 
or you drink a lot of alcohol, if you have a history of a migraine disorder, you're going to have a much worse rebound headache. So your caffeine withdrawal headache is going to be 10 times that of somebody who doesn't have migraines. And you're going to really regret the two or three drinks you had at night because your headache that you get is a rebound. When you get a fever, you're going to get a much bigger headache. So migraine patients' brains seem to be wired, and it seems to be the processing through the trigeminal ganglia, the brain stem, and through the thalamus. So there seems to be slightly different um, connections there. Yeah, so as far as counseling for patients, can just kind of put this in a sort of practical, in a practical sort of uh, approach. The way I counsel my patients is I tell them, I tell them exactly what Dr. Nepper said, that migraine is a hypersensitivity disorder. It's an oversensitive nervous system. So your brain likes to keep things pretty much on the regular. So avoiding caffeine and alcohol, avoiding the not real food food. So highly processed prepackaged stuff with a long shelf life that comes in a box or bag, sticking to minimally processed whole foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean protein, and then, and keeping very well hydrated. And then if beyond that, you notice that you get a headache no matter what, every time you eat strawberries, then don't eat strawberries. Otherwise, I don't really think you need to follow the migraine diet that you find online because I'm, I also like to eat and you won't be able to eat anything on the migraine diet. And I, and I don't think it behaves the same in everybody, just, just like migraine doesn't behave the same in everybody. We do have people keep like a headache diary and a triggery diary. And we say like, okay, like think about what, like again, the other thing is menstrually related migraines, which tend to be the worst. That seems to be the, the drop in greater than 20 microgram drop. And Ann Callahan wrote that con combined um, birth control article. It's the, the rapid drop right before your period that turns on the whole migraine thing and starts the migraine going and going. And that's why my mentally related tend to be right before your period. But I'm just going to say an anecdote. My daughter, when she started getting migraines, when she was like eight or nine, Every time she went to a sleepover, she would come home, be up all night, eating crap, come home with this horrible headache and vomiting. So every time she said to me, I'm going to do a sleepover, I was always like, no, please. <laughs> so you can't always control your triggers, but the more even you can keep your life like a regular routine, eat, hydrating, 60 to 80 ounces, eating regularly, eating snacks, no more than 8 to 12 ounces of caffeine, sleeping, exercising gives you like an extra like um, buffer. That's what we tell. Lifestyle modification is at least 25% of the game. Is that what you would well, say? At, at least. And that's, that's one thing I really like about headache as well, in that I, I'm very much into kind of personal wellness, um, you know, physical and emotional. And it's so much of headache medicine is counseling people on taking better care of themselves. You know, even before the first thing I talk about is before you get to medications is taking better care of yourself. And you'd be shocked at the number of people that come in with daily headache for years, but nobody has told them to stop drinking the two pots of coffee a day, to start drinking more water, to start sleeping better and to start exercising. I've had people who only do that and they come back to see me months later and they're so much better. So we did have a question for Dr. Nepper specifically, and that is um, so in terms of electives right now, because COVID has changed the whole international environment, and um, we have no visiting electives right now. Is that what we're asking about? Um, but I do think that if you're interested in neurology, it is helpful to do electives. Um, we have students right now um, that are doing outpatient electives. If you're interested in neurology because you're interested in stroke, we have a lot of ones that do the stroke elective, which in our case includes like a stint in the interventional radiology suite, um, doing acute thrombectomies. Um, so it is important. I had a not a very good adult experience um, and I ended up, um, when I was a medical student at Pitt. So I did a pediatric neurology. I didn't end up going into Pete's neuro, but I love the, um, my attending who now is the chair of pediatric neurology still after all these years. Um, so yeah, do an, an extra elective. Um, and you can ask your advisor, if you're interested in neuro, meet with the clerkship director and ask them. I'm already meeting with second year students and helping them plan how to do their third year, considering if they're considering neurology and other options. The next question is on the topic of diffuse CNS hyperactivity, what's your experience been with headache patients that have psychiatric comorbidities balancing their medications and psychiatric care? Good. So there is a good reason why neurology is boarded by the American Board of Psychiatry and <laughs> Neurology. There is significant overlap in our fields. 
And I, and it's because they share that, that neurobiology, that, that hypersensitivity, just like for the same reason why uh, migraine and fibromyalgia are comorbid, irritable bowel syndrome is comorbid with migraine, because it all, um, what underpins it all is, is this central hypersensitivity disorder. So we, first of all, we screen every patient who comes into the headache clinic for depression and anxiety. Uh, we ask them on the, on the, you know, the review of systems and we have screening questionnaires of the patients felt before they come for depression and anxiety. And it, uh, it's very important to balance those issues, both in terms of just making sure they get the care that they need. And in certain cases, if it's somebody who just maybe feels, there, there are certain cases where I, where I feel comfortable starting an SSRI or whatever it may be to target both mood and headaches. If it's a patient that I feel needs specialty psychiatric care, then it's getting that person plugged in with behavioral health services. But right. not only not only tackling those issues directly, but also making sure that you're cognitive or cognizant, I should say, of side effects of medications, because there are certain I mean, every medication we have carries the potential for side effects. And there are certain side, of pro side effect profiles with certain medications that you really have to be aware of with people with psychiatric conditions and other medical conditions, of course. So, for instance, if somebody has severe anxiety with migraine, I may want to avoid topiramate because it can exacerbate anxiety. And I may wish to choose a beta blocker instead because it can help with anxiety. As opposed to somebody who has depression, I may want to avoid a beta blocker because it's gonna exacerbate depression. So I think it's making sure that you're aware of those comorbidities and plugging people in when they need to be plugged in with health, with behavioral health services. But for, for some kind of lower risk, more run-of-the-mill cases, I feel comfortable trying to tackle both on my own. Um, I don't know, Dr. Nepp, if you feel any different about that. No, no, I agree with that. I think that sometimes you can, there are, so a lot of the SSRIs don't help migraines. We have kind of small number of ones that might help both. And if it's one of those, but if it goes beyond that, or it's, you know, more serious, we'll usually, a lot of headache centers have psychology and psychiatrists on board. We've been trying to do that for a while. Um, and I think that um, in children, the CHAMPS trial showed that cognitive behavioral therapy was as good as the medication. So especially in children and adolescents, we certainly want to make sure they're, they're hooked in with cognitive behavioral therapy and, mm -hmm. and because that can really be beneficial. Right. I'm going to take this one, this good question from all these questions are so good from Jerome. Um, so I'm thinking of this question right here because um, Claire and I right now are precepting a um, uh, I guess he's a third year student, but he's he's taking he's an MD PhD and he's off for four years now to do um, his PhD, which he's doing not in headache but in Alzheimer imaging in mice. So um, he's in our clinic now and he's an engineer. So every day I meet with him and he's like, well, you know, can't you just say this is the diagnosis, this is a diagnosis, this is a diagnosis, and and I think headache like neurology and like medicine in general, um, it's hard to always put them exactly into the ICHD3 criteria. I mean, we have very specific criteria, but sometimes it doesn't fit in there. And it's so important. And this is what I like about um, headache neurology is to really listen to your patient from the very beginning. So, um, you know, he started taking a history hearing about the headaches and then I went and the patient said something about vision changes. Well, then I went back and said, well, when did you, when he finished, when did you first start getting headaches? Well, I got them when I was a child and then I had this vision change and got numbness in my arm. And I said, if you're questioning whether the headaches now are migraines, the patient has clearly had migraine with aura um, and is having now migraine without aura since childhood. But if you go through, are they worse when you get your period? Like listening to the patient, they're gonna tell you the diagnosis and, um, you know, then I think it's, it's, it, and it isn't always fit in it. Sometimes there's side lock migraines where if they occur only at night and they're only on one side, um, you know, could these possibly be cluster um, if they don't, because cluster can have nausea and, and, and things don't always fit in a clear thing. So you kind of list the range, you do your best shot the first time around, you follow them, and then you sometimes just have to try different things. Usually after a few visits, you have a sense of the situation. You'd say the same thing, Claire. Yeah, I, so I think, uh, so kind of a couple different, so I, I wanted to kind of, I wanted to um, just kind of address the sort of the very last line of that question, and then kind of my, my general approach to, to, to the headache patient. So as far as headaches being triggered by a range of things, I think it's important to discern between trigger and causes, because whenever I have patients with migraine, they want to know what is causing my migraines. You know, they they it's, it's sinus headaches. Is it oh my migraines are from stress or caused by stress? They want to, they want to know what they can do so they can or what it is they can get rid of that problem and never have a migraine again. Migraine is a primary headache problem. 
meaning that it is the problem. It's not the sy symptom of a different problem. So I tell people, you have migraine because you have a migraine disorder, because you have a migraine brain, just like how somebody who has asthma has asthma because they have asthma. But just like certain things can trigger asthma attacks, there are certain things that can trigger migraine as well. And it's not the same as stress causing your migraine. Stress is just a trigger for your migraine attack. For instance, so it's just, I just kind of wanted to kind of address the idea of triggers because tr I think it's important to discern between triggers and causes. Um, right. So my general approach to headache, uh, I'm, I know I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I give credit to Dr. Kanicki, who's a UPMC Headache Center director, because I learned this from him. So he can't sue me because I'm giving him credit. So the three questions that we as providers have to ask ourselves when we see a patient are number one, is it bad? And by that, is it a secondary headache? Is the, is the headache a symptom of a problem that we need to diagnose to make sure we prevent a, pre prevent a bad outcome? And we do see those in the headache clinic. Things like, I mean, I've seen RCVS uh, several times. I've seen intracranial hypertension and hypotension several times. Um, so uh, in order to be able to screen out concerns like that, there are certain criteria or certain features of the headache history that you make sure you have to make sure you have to take to make sure that you're ruling out um, second, or that you're at least considering secondary headaches. So thunderclap onset, headaches, headaches associated with sex or valsalva, headaches in the very young or very old, headaches associated with syncope or seizure, uh, headaches with focal neurologic symptoms lasting longer than an hour or with an abnormal exam are just a few of the, the questions and, and clinical findings that raise red flags for secondary headache. So if you, but then if you feel like you've an, sufficiently answered that question, number one, is it bad? Number two is, is it migraine? Because like I said, migraine is by, by far the most common primary headache disorder we see in the headache center and in, and in any other headache clinic across the country. And so it's just being familiar with migraine criteria, which is very specific. So headaches have to be two out of the following, severe throbbing unilateral worsens with routine activity, and you have to have either nausea or photo and phonophobia. So just knowing those criteria and making sure you ask about them. And then if you don't think it's bad, that doesn't fulfill criteria for migraine, then what is it? And that brings you to the other possible primary headaches like cluster headache or any other tax or painful cranial neuralgias or whatever it may be that we see. But so that's how I kind of systematize my approach to patients. It, it, do I think that this is something bad? Do I think this is a secondary headache where I need to scan this patient or send them to the ER or do some other kind of um, diagnostic to make sure I'm not missing something? If not, if not is this migraine, which in most cases, I mean, it often is for us, um, but not every time, certainly not every time. We have, we've had a lot of really interesting cases roll through the headache center. Um, and then what is it beyond that? Right, I agree with that. What other questions? Anybody else can think of any other questions? We get a lot of referrals. I'm just gonna talk then. We get a lot of referrals from the ear, nose and throat clinic because a lot of patients come in and say, I have these sinus headaches. I've had them my whole life. They run in my family. And then I'm thinking, oh, I don't think sinus headaches run in the family unless they're like seasonal allergies that are you know, familial. And then, so the ear, nose and throat doctors in last year um, are now realizing like if everything's negative and they've scanned them and they've looked up there and this, they refer them to us. And a lot of sinus headaches because the pain is around here and here. Um, and they've been being treated with Sudafed and sinus meds for all these years. And it turns out you put them on a daily preventative medicine, give them a triptan and it goes away. Um, the same is also seen, and we have a great neurotologist here who sees a lot of vertigo. Um, and as you know, in children, children can just get the cyclical vomiting, the cyclical like vertigo, but as it gets older, it kind of morphs into, so there's a vestibular migraine. A lot of our patients that have migraine, um, if it's out of control, in between the migraine, we'll have some vertigo episodes too without the migraine. So a lot of times you give them a daily migraine preventative and it'll turn down all of that. It turned down the light sensitivity, it turns down the vertigo. Um, so, so there's a lot of other manifestations um, of migraine. So we've got, we've got another question that uh, I think is an excellent one. So we've talked a lot about the satisfaction of being a headache specialist. What is one of the greatest frustrations in the subspecialty? Um, so I think we touched, touched on this a little bit earlier, but I, I, it, I think it's navigating insurance companies. It's probably my biggest and, and kind of the red tape paperwork that we have to go through, which I think is probably, the, I think has to be the same answer for pretty much any neurologic um, subspecialty that's mainly outpatient because we do see a lot of um, 
diseases and disorders that require kind of expensive or novel therapies. So you're thinking about the DMTs for multiple sclerosis, for instance, um, treatment modalities for um, certainly neuro-oncology. I mean, for, for a variety of the special, the disorders that we see in neurology in general, they're more sophisticated treatments and therefore more expensive. And therefore insurance companies don't like to pay for them. So to me, that's been the biggest frustration, especially because in, in many cases, there's just no great medical basis for So the one that I'm thinking, for instance, is that in, so no insurance company will pay for both Botox and the CGRP monoclonal antibodies, even though there's no medical reason why you can't be on both of them. They're perfectly safe to take together. And there is, in fact, some case uh, series evidence that they work synergistically. Okay. And I'm going to say that my, I think in a, when I was in my primary care neurology, I would see headache and that you would give them a trip tan and they would be fine. In the tertiary headache referral center, where we're seeing people that have been not only through primary care, but multiple neurologists and come to us, um, there's about 2.5% of the population that gets, has chronic migraines. And that means they have more than 15 headache days a month of which eight of them are um, severe migraine, take me down headaches. Complicating that is that when you're in that much pain and you're having that much, um, th that many headaches, you then start taking overusing your medications. So we see a lot of like Excedrin and said, some people that are on daily triptan. So then it kind of morphs into a, a medication overuse. And then on top of that, if they're taking a lot of Excedrin, they're not sleeping and it's making their anxiety worse. And so there's like a cascade and sometimes um, you know, you feel frustrated because you keep trying and you, um, you know, the patients don't want to stop their medication overuse until they get the preventative on board. And so it sometimes is a, is a few months of painful, a lot of emails back and forth saying, you know, you got to stick with the thing and, you know, you got to try this and you got to try that. It takes a little while for these medications to get on board. So that, that's, that's, um, that can be hard. The good thing is at least 40 to 50% of people with, um, chronic migraine will eventually go over to episodic again. There's also a very tiny population. We've seen some of these in COVID now that have this terrible entity, which again, sometimes can spontaneous go away, but sometimes it can last a long time called a new daily persistent headache, which unfortunately um, you do every evaluation, you try everything. And sometimes it just has to happen. It happens sometimes after viruses and sometimes after vaccines and other kind of like autoimmune things. Yeah, I mean, I think actually you brought up a great point, Dr. Knepper, um, which I think is probably sometimes it's my source of great, greatest frustration, but at the same time, it's probably my greatest source of satisfaction as well, is that pain patients, well, I mean, that's because what, that's what we are, we're pain specialists. And I think pain is sort of the most salient complaint that people can bring to a physician, right? If you are in pain, you're going to complain about it. You're going to go see somebody about it. Yeah. Um, and pain patients because they are in pain, they tend to be a little bit needier. And I, you know, and I, for, for good reason. Um, so it can be a little bit frustrating to, and especially because migraine preventers can take two months to kick in. Um, there are a lot of people who we start them on a treatment program and we just get a weekly or, or twice weekly email from them saying it doesn't work yet. It's not working. It's not working. And just kind of having to reassure them that it takes some time, be patient, um, you know, we, we just, we have, we don't know whether or not this is going to work for you yet. So it is a little bit more handholding, I think, than, than, um, in some other specialties, but I get a lot of satisfaction out of that too, because on the other end of the, they then come back. Um, most of them, I would say, come back saying, thank you for helping me yeah. through this. And I have a couple cluster headache patients that are in their seventies. They have multiple stents. You can't do the normal treatment with them um, because you can't give them the trip. And I know as soon as they call, it's usually the wife that calls crying. Um, okay, I got to get on top of this. And we can usually knock a cluster out pretty fast, but we're limited. We have limited tools when they have stents on board, but um, it's hard to watch people suffer. Um, and it's hard to hear their suffering, but I, you get to know your patients when you're following and you know, as soon as they call, oh, you know, I got to get on top of this. Yep. So, so do you tend to get emergency cases? How often do you admit them? And what are the most common emergencies and reasons for admission? So from the headache clinic, it's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. um, I have probably sent somebody to the ED in the past, the past three years, maybe twice. Yeah. So it's very unusual for somebody to present de novo to the headache center for a, uh, at a least thunderclap for, headache. For, a, for a thunderclap headache. Right. So the one instance that I had was a patient who had RCBS. Yeah. And he just happened to be able to get in the cancellation where he saw me a couple of days into, or like a week into his, um, his period of, of thunderclap headache. So um, it's pretty rare. 
Um, when I, the, the only times I think I've sent people is when I was concerned for, w w w in cases of thunderclap headache, where I was concerned yeah. for subarachnoid hemorrhage. Yes. Right. Um, I, I don't think anybody has actually had subarachnoid that I've sent over. I don't know. No. Same for you, Dr. Nepper. I agree with that. No, thankfully not. Usually people go to the ER. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully. These are all great questions, guys. Mm -hmm. Any recommendations for M1s, M2s to gain more experience or understanding of the headache subspecialty? This has been a great talk, and I would love to know more as I move forward in med school and eventually apply to programs. So I would say that if you have a headache clinic, um, especially, so one thing I would say now, honestly, is that headache medicine lends itself very nicely to telemedicine because most headache patients have normal, normal neurologic exams. The one big downside is that you can't do fundoscopy. And I have had at least one new patient present um, during COVID times where I had to see them virtually and the patient ended up having IIH. I had a high enough clinical suspicion where I started an investigation anyway, but it would have been really nice to have visualized the optic disc edema and started um, acetazolamide earlier for the patient. But, so what I, but, but even though it's hard to get into um, uh, shadowy experiences and electives. Otherwise, if you have a headache clinic or, or somebody in your neurology group who has an interest in headache, and if they're doing telemedicine, it may be possible right now to um, be able to kind of shadow some of those telemedicine appointments. That's, I and mean, that's what we're doing right now with, with our current um, third year student. He's actually at home virtually logging in to these appointments right now. And I'm of course, I'm going to shout out for the AAN to the AAN medical student has a great medical student tab that I send all of my medical students there. You can hop on. They've got great online resources. Um, last year, my students, when COVID happened in March, were able to get access to the, um, the AAN meeting online. And there's all kinds of headache resources, all subspecialty resources through the AAN.com. So definitely check that out. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you really, you can't avoid headache. Like, like we said at the top of the talk, it is the most common reason for outpatient neurologic consultation. And no matter what you do, even if, if some of you decide not to do neurology, you are going to be taking care of headache patients because it is so prevalent. Yes. This was great guys. Great questions. We hope you all become headache neurologists. There's a great need out there. Yep. Thank you guys. Thank you.